My video last week was all about the recent data dump and 11 science publications that have come from the LOFAR collaboration. LOFAR being a huge radio telescope of antennas spread over 2,000 kilometers across Europe, which meant that we've seen black hole burps in 20 times more detail than we've ever seen before. If you haven't checked out that video yet, I'll link it up in the cards and down in the video description below. But if you have, you'll know that as part of that video, I interviewed Dr. Leia Morabito from Durham University, who co-led this this huge big data release uh, and the pipeline that allows people to access the data as well. Now in the original video, only five minutes of our chat made it into that final cut. However, we chatted for a lot longer. So without any further ado, here is my full chat with Dr. Leia Morabito, an assistant professor at Durham University. Okay, so Leia, um, tell me first of all, what is your role in the LOFAR collaboration? Right, so I am co-chair of the LOFAR Long Baseline Working Group, along with uh, Dr. Neil Jackson at Manchester. Um, and so this is a working group that's comprised mostly of PhDs and, and postdocs, um, and it's dedicated to uh, all things high resolution imaging with LOFAR. So LOFAR has antennas spread all across Europe, and in standard operations, we only use the ones that are located in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. which gives us kind of like a smaller effective lens than we can get if we add in the, the, all of the antennas from all across Europe. Um, and pairs of antennas give us information and uh, the distance between two pairs of antennas is a baseline. And so when we say long baselines, we're, we just mean talking about like the most remote antennas. So you are responsible for like the, the, the biggest of the big arrays that, that LOFAR can achieve. That's really cool. Um, and LOFAR is really special, isn't it? Because it doesn't combine the information in, in real time like a lot of these big uh, radio and interferometer arrays do. Does it give you an advantage in some way to do it after the fact? Yeah, so it first what's known as a, a software telescope, which means that the antennas don't actually move themselves. So we have to introduce things in the signal path after we've recorded the data to be able to point to the telescope. So this is called electronic pointing rather than mechanical pointing because the actual tel telescope, the actual antennas don't move. Mm. And so by by doing this after we've recorded the data, but before we've combined it all together, we can point the telescope in different directions in the sky. It just gives us a little bit more flexibility uh, to be able to do this. There are some limitations. You can't just point in any particular direction that you want to because the individual antennas have their own field of, of view. And sometimes we just have to reobserve because the ionosphere, which is the, the uh, most distant layer of the Earth's atmosphere. There's a lot of free electrons running around up there and they they kind of, it's like trying to look through water, right? Like you, you get all of these waves and everything and it distorts the image coming in. And so the ionosphere, if it's bad for a particular observation, we, we just have to reobserve. We can't do anything about it. I, I love the idea of just like you guys sat in your offices and like looking at some, like an image that's coming out of some data and you're like, damn that ionosphere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <definitely. laughs> just cursing it now i mean recording that much data sort of like you know everything you get from the antenna must be an incredible amount of data to then after the effect go but i only just want to focus on this little bit like how much data are we actually talking to, to actually do this this electronic pointing so the data coming off from the entire array, if you look at the data rate from, from the actual antennas themselves, is something like tens of petabytes per second. Um, but that's too much. So we do, we do a combination of data in uh, two steps. So the first thing we do is we combine all of the, the data from the individual antennas, so the individual wire antennas themselves, in what we call a station. So we have 96 um, antennas that are collected into a station, and then we have stations spread throughout Europe. So we have to combine at the station level because that's just too much data for us to, to deal with. Um, and so we combine the data there, and then you get something more like terabytes of data that go to the correlator, and then it's all put together, um, combining the information from the different stations. I mean, even like terabytes a second, that's way beyond like like data transfer speed surely surely like it's coming in like quicker than you can even get it off the telescopes yeah i mean it takes longer to process data than it does to actually do the observation for lofar um, wow. which is not the case for for many other radio telescopes it's really we're learning a lot about how to do it though mm -hmm. and um it's gotten a lot better um over the last few years as we've understood what we need to do the, to the data and then you know, improved our algorithms in the way that we process it. Uh, but we're still 
we're still at a, a processing to observing time larger than one. <laughs> we're still working on it, so. And it's the sheer size of the array, like across Europe, that's made this specific data release, you know, this, this increase in resolution that you've got with these long baselines possible. Like, how do you, how do you, how do you do that really? How do you go about coordinating, you know, something across such a, a huge scale? Yeah, it's been really challenging. I, I mean, the first thing was that we, when we started observing, we didn't know how to deal with this. And uh, there are standard things that you do for, for data calibration um, in radio astronomy. And we, we've worked these out for the Dutch array um, where your telescopes are located more closely together. And you don't have to worry about some of the issues of combining the information from the other stations. Um, but one of the things I worked on in my PhD and I've continued to work on now is how you actually combine all the data from these international stations where they're looking for uh, looking through different parts of the ionosphere and they're all on different clocks. And so you have to synchronize the clocks and there's just all these kinds of technical things that go on when you go to these longer baselines that you don't have to handle. And so I've really helped develop the way that we do this data calibration and figured out all of the issues um, and been as part of this working group, um, you know, we've built a pipeline. And so that's, uh, that's what I've been leading is building this pipeline, which will hopefully make the, um, the data calibration more accessible to people who aren't, you know, they don't have to become an expert to use the pipeline. Yeah. Like I had to become an expert to build the pipeline. Yeah, yeah. So you can just sort of produce them with, with the final data product and be like, go forth and do science. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because that's the point is to do science. And yeah. we have to sort out all of this technical stuff first. But, uh, but mm. it, the, really the goal is to be able to do science with these incredible images. The fact that we're doing this at low frequency gives you more scientific information than you can get with high frequency. Mm -hmm. And at low frequency, there's a couple of advantages. And the first is survey speed. So we can actually uh, survey the whole sky at subarc second resolution, whereas telescopes at higher frequencies, which have similar resolution, can only do small fields of view at a time. And it's really not practical to survey the entire sky with eMerlin, for example. Um, and so the low frequency allows you to get uh, the survey speed, but it also gives you more information because radio emission has a particular shape to it mm. across frequency. And so it's brighter at low frequencies um, than it is at higher frequencies. But then you also have physical processes like absorption and those you can only see at low frequencies. And so by adding in this low frequency information, we actually get more information. We're able to pick out what's going on in some of these sources, um, which we couldn't do with just the high frequency information that we have. A lot of what we learn from, from doing this with LOFAR is going to massively inform what we do in like future radio surveys as well. Like the big buzz is obviously the SKA being built across South Africa and Australia. Um, so is there anything specific, do you think, that, that LOFAR will, will teach us about, about those for when they come online? Yeah, I mean, we're already learning a lot about how to deal with the data volume that we'll have with something like the SKA. Um, and I think that the work that we're doing, the high resolution work that we're doing will help us inform maybe some of the galaxy survey stuff that uh, the SKA will do. Um, so looking for particular types of galaxies, um, but we'll learn about these types of galaxies with LOFAR and then be able to go fainter uh, with the SKA. And there is actually an SKA uh, high resolution working group, the SKA VLBI or Very Long Baseline Interferometry Working Group. Um, which will look to combine the SKA with other telescopes around the world to get super high resolution. Um, and so our work that we're doing now with LOFAR will really help us uh, with that because the SKA low, for example, doesn't, there's no other telescope that uh, aside from LOFAR that is doing this kind of work. Mm -hmm. So it, it will really help us out there. Mm. And it's wonderful to hear about, you know, the, so many international partners, you know, to make that happen as well. Like you must have colleagues like so far. And as you say, on different time zones, just like the antenna as well that you've got to coordinate. Yeah, that's true. And and since I started working on this, we've added stations to the array in Poland and Latvia. And those have uh, helped improve the resolution, but then also brought other people into the collaboration. And one of the really nice things I, I love about this working group is that it's mostly driven by PhD students and a couple mm -hmm. of postdocs, but it's really the, the early career researchers that have really helped drive forward all of these advances um, in the calibration techniques that we use to, to be able to do this. It's, it's really, really nice to see. 
yeah, just getting like, you know, like fresh ideas in there from, from new people coming into the collaboration, right? And like from diverse backgrounds, it always helps to push forward the science, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. So um, now all of these, you've done all the hard work, right? You've done all the, you've built the pipeline and you've, um, you know, put this out for people so they don't have to become necessarily experts like you. You must have done this so you can do some science yourself, right, as well. And I know there's been a lot of science released with, with the press release and everything that's come out, but what are you hoping to do now that you have, you know, the ability to get your hands on this data? Yeah, so the the paper that I've, I've led has been a demonstration of the pipeline on one of a typical survey field. So we're doing a survey, the low fry two meter sky survey of the Northern sky. Um, and all of the data thus far has been recorded with all of the stations, but we've only been processing it with the Dutch stations. Mm. So what I'm now working on is post-processing that data to include all of the stations and get this incredible resolution. And that a lot will allow me to, to do the first you know, subarc second radio survey of the entire northern sky, um, which will not only provide an awesome database for astronomers to use. Yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> but <clears throat> one of the things I'm personally interested in is trying to figure out what kind of, what the source of radio emission is in radio quiet uh, active galactic nuclei. Mm -hmm. So where you have a supermassive black hole that's feeding on its galaxy, right? If the radio is not like super bright and super big, then we don't actually know what is causing it because it's it's just, you know, in a standard radio survey, it's unresolved, which means it's just a blob. And so we have no idea where this radio is coming from. And we don't really know if it's star formation or if it's something to do with the, the supermassive black hole itself. Um, and uh, people have done little studies, you know, s smaller scale um, and have gotten, you know, have made advances. But what we really need is an all sky survey where you can mm -hmm. sort this out just, you know, once and for all in this population of galaxies, this is the dominant effect. Um, and you really need the large number of sources to be able to do that. And so you really need this kind of survey um, that we're starting to, to do now. Yeah, this the statistics you're trying to get at right then is sort of like not the individual cases, but just be like, it's a whole sweep of things. But that's so cool because I mean, I obviously work on the same thing, right? Active black holes, but I'm focusing on like the the really active things, the stuff that you can't help but see because they're just they're just shouting you with all the emissions. So it's really cool to think about how you're looking at the opposite end, almost the ones that could fly under the radar a little bit with you know, radar, <laughs> radio. Um, well, to comply to the radar a little bit with the fact that they, you know, are so, um, you know, not that luminous with, with their radio emission. And I'm really curious to find, like, what you do find. Are we going to find that there's this whole, you know, new emission from black holes that we didn't know existed because they're in a different phase of their accretion or something like that? I mean, you must be so excited to see, you know, what it, what it would find. Like, do, I know you said it could be star formation, but is there... What's like the, the hope? Like what's your like leading hypothesis right now for what it could be? Well, I think one of the things is that um, we see these very large scale jets, right? And they're very mm. big and bright, like Cygnus A, for example, um, very big, bright, beautiful radio sources. Um, <clears throat> and for a long time, people just thought, you know, you have these really large scale jets and that it must be something different on the small scale. But what we're seeing now more with LOFAR is that there are fainter things and smaller mm -hmm. things um, that also have jets. And so I think one of the things that we will find is that there are more jets out there than we think there are mm -hmm. um, right now. I think that's one of the things that we'll find. But I, I mean, really, what excites me most is that anytime you do a new kind of survey, then you always find something unexpected. So like, I can't tell you. <laughs> what I think the most exciting thing is, because I'm sure my mind will change in like two years when we find something completely new. Mm. Um, but I mean, doing such a, an, an all sky radio survey at such a resolution really, I think, will bring some some new, exciting, uh, unexpected things. And that mm. that is really what excites me the most. Yeah, all the um, the unknown unknowns or even just the unknown knowns. Right. They could be in the LOFA data right now that you've just released, but we haven't you know had, had the time to look at it all yet and 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 so we haven't been able to pull it out yet like that must excite you so much thinking there's just a buried treasure somewhere in that data that you've been processing yeah absolutely i mean and buried treasure is a great great image i mean because the data does exist and now it's just a matter of processing it with the, the calibration techniques that we've developed so mm. 
I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. I'm going to keep an eye out for like every single lo-fi paper that pops up now because you're going to be like, what did they find? <laughs> A huge thank you to Leia for taking the time to speak to me about the work that she's doing with the LOFAR collaboration. I also spoke to PhD student Shruti Badole and also Fritz Vian as part of uh, the video that I put out last week as well. So look out for the full interviews with those coming up on my channel this week as well.